So hello everybody, welcome to the 10th Servo Blood Flow Seminar Series. Um, today it will be another very exciting seminar uh, where, sorry, I'll just, so uh, it will be a seminar about cerebrovascular dysfunction in uh, disease states chaired by Dr. Uh, James Fisher, which is a, an associate professor at the, the University of Auckland in New Zealand. So before um, letting him uh, speak with his, uh, the, 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 his keynote talk, let's review uh, maybe one last time um, or another time the rules of engagement. So uh, please keep your microphone on mute and video off throughout the, your session. Uh, there will be a five minute and uh, a three minute abstract talk uh, or time for questions at the end of each presentation. So if you have a question, please uh, either use the raise and feature or type it uh, into the chat. Uh, so the, so the, the session chair will invite you to ask uh, your question. Uh, the, the session will be recorded, sorry. And posted on the cerebral vascular or the uh, Carnet uh, website within the week. And so without any further ado, uh, I will let uh, Dr. Fisher uh, present his, uh, his talk. Okay. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Good morning. Um, wherever you are, thanks for joining us. Um, I'd just like to start by thanking Patrice for the introduction. Also, um, Patrice and, and Caroline, really, for taking the initiative to organize this, uh, this seminar series. I think it's, um, it's a really excellent initiative, given the, the present difficulties we, we find ourselves in um, connecting as a community. So, uh, Great work, guys. Um, I'm very excited for the opportunity to present some work uh, we've been doing recently in atrial fibrillation and to talk, you about, talk to you about some new studies we've just finished and some future work we've got planned. Uh, also really excited by the opportunity to um, introduce some early career researchers to you today who are uh, Mathilda Paré, Zoe Adams, Mickey Fan, and Kelly Larkin Kaiser who are going to tell you about their um, exciting new work, uh, all centered around this topic of cerebral vascular dysfunction in disease states. So yes, yeah, so I'm gonna talk about cerebral vascular dysfunction in atrial fibrillation. Uh, I'm based at the University of Auckland here and uh, specifically uh, in Manaki Manawa, the Center of Heart Research. And um, as you perhaps tell from my accent, I'm. Not a Kiwi native, uh, been in Auckland a, a couple of years now following um, family negotiations as prolonged and protracted as Brexit, but we, uh, we made it and uh, very, very happy to be here. So why, why atrial fibrillation? So atrial fibrillation is the most common sustained heart rhythm abnormality. Uh, one in four middle-aged adults will be um, affected by atrial fibrillation in their lifetime. And in the next 20 years, the incidence of this condition is expected to double. Uh, it's characterized by this rapid propagation of electrical signals in a very disorganized way around the atria and uh, coupled with uh, an irregular contraction um, of, of, the, of the atria. And you can see the classic uh, electrocardiogram uh, signal at the bottom here and, and characterized as being irregularly irregular. Um, so atrial fibrillation has an insidious effect on the brain. Uh, people with atrial fibrillation are approximately five times more likely to have a stroke um, than those that don't have atrial fibrillation and, and no cardiovascular conditions. This is data from the, from the Framingham study here. Uh, and in fact, these rates of stroke exceed those seen in other common cardiovascular conditions such as hypertension and, and coronary artery disease. And in fact, one in six strokes occurs in a person with atrial fibrillation. So while cardioembolotic stroke is um, common in atrial fibrillation, uh, there's also evidence that cognitive decline and dementia um, occur increased rates in patients with atrial fibrillation in the absence of stroke and even if they're actually uh, anticoagulated. This is shown here in the data of uh, Graves, where they've looked at five-year incidence of dementia, uh, 
in uh, patients with atrial fibrillation in the open bars and uh, non-atrial fibrillation patients in the closed bars. And both groups here are anticoagulated for, for, for various reasons. And you can see the increased rates in patients with um, atrial fibrillation. So at, at the moment, it remains uh, incompletely understood what is the AF specific factor that increases this risk of cognitive disorders in atrial fibrillation uh, in the absence of clot related stroke. And um, perhaps as you see from the title, you might, might guess um, that through a series of studies, what we've been interested in exploring is whether there is a cerebral vascular dysfunction in atrial fibrillation. So um, the group here well knows that um, the regulation of cerebral blood flow is complex and multifactorial. And then these are just some of the, the main players when we think about the terms of cerebral blood flow regulation. Uh, we know that the cerebral vasculature is uh, highly sensitive to changes in the arterial partial pressure of CO2 and when this increases we get a vasodilation and vice versa. Uh, we know that um, there is a close uh, spatial and temporal coupling between neuronal activation and uh, blood flow um, via a process known as neurovascular coupling and that there are uh, a host of autoregulatory processes uh, possessed by the blood vessels within the brain whereby cerebral oxygen delivery is uh, maintained in the face of, of fluctuations in, in blood pressure. And the point I really want to make just by um, flashing this up is that um, disorders in, in um, these specific facets of cerebral vascular function are associated with poor outcomes in, in some patient populations. So if we, if we take the example of cerebral vascular carbon dioxide sensitivity, it's known to be diminished in a number of cerebral vascular and neurological conditions. Um, it's associated with poor outcomes in ischemic stroke. And um, data such as this supports the contention that at a population level, uh, those individuals with poorest uh, CO2 reactivity have a uh, poorer survival uh, longer term. Similarly, um, in terms of neurovascular coupling, it's known to be diminished in several cerebral vascular and neurovascular um, neural, neurological conditions such as stroke, hypertension, etc. and also linked to, to cognitive dysfunction. Um, also with cerebral autoregulation, um, impaired in a number of neurological conditions and linked to poor outcomes post-traumatic brain injury. So um, given this background, uh, we set out to address three main questions uh, through a series of studies. First is the evidence for cerebral vascular uh, CO2 reactivity uh, impairments in patients with atrial fibrillation. Is neurovascular coupling diminished in patients with atrial fibrillation? And is cerebral autoregulation diminished in patients with atrial fibrillation? And uh, let's just begin at the outset by acknowledging uh, the funding provided by the British Heart Foundation for the studies I'll describe. Um, and these studies were all performed in collaboration with uh, Professor Gregory Lipp, who I think it's very fair to say is a world authority in atrial fibrillation. And um, initially they were driven by Dr. Eagle Braz, a talented um, clinician uh, a scientist from Brazil, and then uh, picked up by uh, Dr. Rahan Jr., who um, is now has his own uh, lab at uh, Manchester Metropol Metropolitan University. So uh, really acknowledgements to them for doing all the, the hard yards with this. Okay, so to, to address these questions, um, we recruited three groups of um, individuals, obviously atrial fibrillation patients, and we, uh, we matched them with a group of healthy controls who uh, were of similar age. Um, because of the uh, increased comorbidity, specifically hypertension in patients with atrial fibrillation, and the fact that we're taking um, medications for cardiovascular risk factors, we also recruited a disease control group, uh, that is patients with a clinical diagnosis of hypertension. Uh, we performed a number of pre-testing procedures, as you might expect, including written informed consent, uh, a number of physiological measurements, uh, heart rate, blood pressure, uh, uh, ventilation, 
and transcranial Doppler ultrasound, uh, all of which I'm sure most people tuning in will be familiar with. Uh, participants were principally studied in a, a supine position and in the following order, we assess cerebral vascular function in terms of the neurovascular coupling, CO2 reactivity, and cerebral autoregulation. And what I'll do is present the, the specific methods we used and couple that with the, with the, with the data. Um, so just a, a quick picture uh, to show you the experimental setup. Um, really don't need to dwell on this. I'm sure you're all quite familiar with this heart rate through ECG, blood pressure through the phenometer, uh, ventilation using Hans Rudolph pneumatech, and capnography for the end tidal CO2 as a proxy for uh, arterial levels, and transcranial Doppler ultrasound. Okay, so these are the, the principal participant characteristics. Uh, we recruited about 30 patients in each group, they were closely matched for age, a uh, similar proportion of men and women. BMI was slightly higher in the two patient populations. Um, the incidence of hypertension and blood pressure per se was highest in the hypertension group, as you might well expect. And about just over half of our atrial fibrillation patients had, had high blood pressure. Uh, you can see the, the various medications used there. And um, I, uh, perhaps we, we are happy to talk about this subsequently in terms of the uh, specific inclusion exclusion criteria, only at this point to say that we ruled out um, all the confounding comorbidities that we could, including things like structural heart problems, um, uh, yeah, valvular disease, um, uh, type two diabetes and, and uh, previous stroke, et cetera, and the, and the like. Okay, so just turning to the data, one of the interesting observations we picked up from, from the baseline data was a, a reduction in the middle cerebral artery mean blood flow velocity in the patients with atrial fibrillation versus the healthy controls by about 16%. Um, and also cerebral, uh, this measure of cerebral perfusion was about 13% lower in the hypertensives than the healthy controls, similar age. Now, when we looked at this a little bit more closely, specifically the atrial fibrillation group, and divided them into individuals that were uh, fibrillating, shown on the, on the right, uh, versus those that were not fibrillating at the, the time of uh, examination, the cerebral perfusion was lowest in the group that were actually fibrillating. So just, just to clarify that, so um, a proportion of patients with atrial fibrillation will be in permanent atrial fibrillation. That means they'll have the arrhythmia uh, continuously. Uh, but some might be in paroxysmal atrial fibrillation where the, um, where the AF will spontaneously resolve uh, from time to time. Okay, so to just move on to these study questions. The first one is cerebral vascular CO2 reactivity diminished in patients with atrial fibrillation. So to address this, we um, asked our patients, um, healthy controls, to breathe through a, a breathing circuit connected to a Douglas bag, um, where for four minutes they were increase, uh, breathing gas with um, an increased fraction of carbon dioxide. Initially, it was 4%, then went up to 7%. And then we asked them to hypoventilate to lower their end tidal CO2 to an equal but opposite uh, amount. And um, there are, of course, a various, various different ways of assessing cerebral vascular CO2 reactivity. Um, just to say that um, we were quite pleased with the, um, the, the between day test retest reliability of the method that, that we used. So um, this is the, the main data from uh, this aspect of the Study. So we're looking at cerebral vascular CO2 slope, so expressing the middle cerebral artery mean blood flow velocity in centimeters per second per millimeter of uh, end tidal CO2 change. And we found that um, overall there was about a 30% lowering of CO2 reactivity in the patients with atrial fibrillation versus the healthy controls, and no difference between the healthy controls and the patients with hypertension. When we subsequently subdivided our um, 
fibrillation patients again into those that were fibrillating versus those that were not fibrillating at the, at the time of study, there was no significant difference between, between the groups, although there is um, numerically, anyway, a, a slightly lower CO2 reactivity in those that were, that were fibrillating uh, when studied. So moving on to the second study question, is neurovascular coupling diminished in patients with atrial fibrillation? So to, uh, to investigate this, we use the bilateral insonation in a, in a subset of participants. So on one side, we were insonating the middle cerebral artery, uh, and then on the other side of the head, we were insonating the posterior cerebral artery. Uh, and this is because it's perfusing the visual cortex and responds um, quite predictably to uh, visual stimulation. So this is uh, this was first used by Uslid in the, in the late, late 80s, and this is an original record taken from um, this uh, early publication showing an increase in perfusion selectively in the, in the PCA during a, a light eyes open phase versus the dark eyes closed. And on the right hand side, you can see that those traces signal averaged. So we, we perform this eyes open, eyes closed, 30 seconds, each for uh, uh, five cycles. And um, the main outcome variable, um, once we analyzed the B2B data and done a cubic spline interpretation was the peak PCA uh, conductance response. And, and this is the data. Uh, so on the left-hand side, we're looking at the, the mean from, um, from the whole different cohorts we studied. And in the healthy controls shown with the blue lines, we get about a 20% increase in, uh, in PCA, cerebral vascular conductance, uh, but that was significantly diminished in both the atrial fibrillation and the hypertension uh, group uh, with no difference between them. Uh, and then looking to the right-hand side panel, you can see this is the, the peak response in, the, in those three groups. And you can see the statistical comparisons bear that out. Um, Finally, is cerebral autoregulation diminished in patients with atrial fibrillation? So to investigate this, um, we not only made some baseline measurements, but we asked our participants to perform the repeated squat stand uh, maneuver at 0.1 hertz to induce uh, these sizable changes um, in their blood pressure and also the MCA uh, V-mean. And then we use transfer function analysis of phase gain and coherence at that 0.1 hertz uh, frequency. And not to dwell on this uh, too much, um, but we use the approach advocated in this, uh, the Carnet white paper and the, um, the MATLAB algorithms uh, provided by, by that. So we're very grateful for that. So this is the, the main outcome variables from, from that data. Um, on the left-hand side, we're looking at normalized gain, and we can see that this is increased in the atrial fibrillation patients compared with both the healthy controls and the hypertension. So this elevated normalized gain um, is indicative of um, poorer buffering um, by the cerebral vasculature in response to changes in mean blood pressure. Uh, in terms of phase, phase was slightly but non-significantly elevated in the atrial fibrillation versus the healthy controls and uh, was actually significantly elevated in the hypertension uh, group versus the healthy controls. So just to summarize real quickly there, in terms of our questions and the answers um, as we, we perceive them to be, so is cerebral vascular CO2 reactivity diminished in patients with atrial fibrillation? Yes, we believe we have some evidence for that at least. Uh, is neurovascular coupling diminished? Again, yes, we'd say so. And the same answer with uh, cerebral autoregulation, certainly in terms of when we look at the repeated squat to stand maneuver. So I'd just like to finish by touching on a, a couple of future directions, just to give you a heads up about what's uh, coming next. Um, we've just finished a, a project, this is driven by uh, Dr. Rahan Jr., looking at uh, oral anticoagulant use in patients with atrial fibrillation, um, specifically looking at uh, warfarin versus apixaban, apixaban being a, a novel or a new oral anticoagulant medication 
uh, that has been shown to, certainly in this Aristotle trial, uh, reduce the risk of, of stroke, but also reduce the risk of, of bleeding in patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, and here we've been looking at cerebral vascular function as a main outcome variable, but also in flow-mediated dilatation. So we're, we're quite excited to, to look um, whether this medication use might be um, causing differences um, in these main outcome variables. But also now that we're, we've, we've got quite a large, ball, a large um, cohort of, um, of participants, we're, we're going to be running some multiple regression analysis to really try and tease out some of the, the independent predictors of cerebral vascular function in this, this uh, population. Um, and just finally, so we've recently here in Auckland been awarded a, a Royal Society Marston uh, grant for a, a three-year study to, to move these types of studies into the MRI, uh, to use some arterial spin labeling um, to make measurements of, um, of cerebral perfusion uh, during the types of uh, measurements I've been uh, describing. Firstly, looking at cross-section analyses, um, but also trying to uh, characterize the responses in patients with atrial fibrillation pre and post um, uh, cardioversions, so either through um, yeah, cardioversion or uh, cryoablation to um, acutely restore sinus uh, rhythm. So we can look at the direct effects of, of the arrhythmia per se, perhaps in the, in the in these cerebral vascular function measurements we've looked at. Uh, and then the second angle we're trying to pursue is, is trying to understand the mechanistic basis for the cerebral vascular dysfunction uh, a little better and, and focusing in on, on the endothelium and, and nitric oxide a little bit more specifically. So work from uh, Professor Greg Lipp's group has um, provided evidence for uh, systemic and uh, peripheral endothelial uh, dysfunction and damage. So we know that endothelial... Uh, von Willebrand factor um, is, is um, higher in, in the plasma, and also that um, flow-mediated dilatation uh, within the brachial artery is lower in patients with atrial fibrillation versus healthy controls. So what we're interested in doing is trying to rescue some of this nitric oxide signaling within the cerebral vasculature and, um, and see how that affects cerebral vascular function using MRI. So with that, I would just like to uh, acknowledge the contributions made by uh, people I noted earlier, uh, particularly Rahan and Igor, um, and also the support of Professor Greg Lipp that continues to this day, and also some, some new collaborators here at the, uh, the University of, of Auckland, um, where I look forward to taking this, this work forward, and of course the, the funders that are, are vital for these, these types of studies. So with that, I think I'll uh, wrap up. Thanks for listening. Thank you very much, James. This is a fascinating story. And it's always impressive to see uh, how we, um, the ease that we have to, the possibility to have, we have to study those clinical, more complicated clinical populations. So do not hesitate to ask questions uh, via the, the chat. And I may ask uh, maybe the first one if uh, while the others uh, are uh, writing theirs. Um, as uh, we are, for example, uh, studying uh, peripheral vascular disease patients and those guys are taking a lot of medication, is it possible to just um, discuss a little bit about in your uh, cohort of uh, AF patients, the, the role of uh, the, those medications uh, on the different uh, mechanism you have studied? Uh, it's a really good point. Patrice. Um, so we, we didn't stop the anticoagulants, so if they, would, they did take them the morning of the study. Um, in terms of the other cardioactive medications, we did ask them to just withhold their morning medications and take them after the study. Um, but that's relatively acute. Um, the, it's, it's tough to, to, to get around. I mean, we've not studied it systematically. I mean, the best thing, I think, we could have done is to, to include that disease control group who were taking some cardioactive medications for, for high blood pressure and, and, and whatnot. And then you can see there the various um, uh, 
similarities and differences between between those groups. I think if we'd have just predicated this purely on um, versus a healthy control group, that that would have been um, yeah even more, more of an issue. But it's an important question. Thanks for raising it. Thanks. Uh, okay, we have a few questions from, from the first one from Ronald Schondorf. Do you think that the variable or perhaps even impaired cardiac output of patients with AF may affect the measurements made or at least, uh, or at least comparisons? Um, yes, yeah, I think, that's, I think that's important. I think the, the pattern of cardiac output acutely and I think the absolute level of cardiac output is, is important. Um, we've not studied it systematically. I hope with the subsequent studies where we can study the same people uh, with and without in sinus rhythm might um, lend some more um, insight there. We will be doing cardiac MRI this, um, as well in these, these studies. Um, so we will be able to measure, measure cardiac output. Um, so yes, I do think it, it's perfectly possible that it's, uh, we know um, well, there's some mixed evidence, but you would expect cardiac output, resting cardiac output to increase uh, once someone's, the sinus rhythm is restored. But in terms of how that then affects some of these uh, reactivity tasks um, is perhaps less well understood. And maybe just a follow-up commentary from Dr. Schondorf, it may be of interest to test patients with cardiomyopathy without AF as another control group. Uh, yeah, I think we are looking into that, actually. I think the combination of heart failure with atrial fibrillation is um, exceptionally important. They, they've been referred to as the vicious twins, and these, these off, they often um, coincide, and um, one can cause the other, and the other can you know, cause, cause the other. So, um, that, but that's not been investigated in this population, but I, I think it's an excellent suggestion. It's certainly something we're interested in pursuing. Great. Uh, another question from uh, Phil Ainsley. Uh, great talk. Uh, two quick questions. First, there, there seemed to be some really high resting mean vel uh, MCA velocity. Did you screen for intracranial stenosis? So let, let's start with this. <laughs> um, there was no clinical reports of that. I don't think the, the velocities are exceptionally high, somewhere on the, the high end of normal. Um, but I Nothing there struck me as being um, um, exceptionally high. Um, in terms of the, the yeah, so. Okay. Don't know and, and how do you reconcile your negative CO2 reactivity slopes as well as negative phase values in a few individuals? Yeah, it's, it's difficult to, 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 to do that. Um, we just didn't, in some of those um, individuals, we just don't, didn't see the, the increases that you would expect. So um, we just took the, the values at those points and, and went with the data. I, I, think, um, I think it's really important to show individual data points like this. Um, um, but I don't think our means and standard deviations or standard errors are, are exceptional. And um, I think in, previously when we were the, the, the tendency was to use these plunger plots. I think that can hide all kinds of things. So I, I'm, I'm pretty sure we're not the only people that have seen this, this type of um, phenomena, but, but some people just didn't have the, the sorts of responses uh, that we'd expect, but we, you know, we, we inspected those really carefully. We, it did um, draw our curiosity, let's say, to, to, to double check and make sure they were, they were real non-responders. Great, uh, and maybe the one last question from uh, Tracy Bernard. It was uh, interesting to break your AF groups into fibrillating and non versus non-fibrillating. Did you repeat this analysis within this group breaking on hypertension given it seemed half at hypertension? Um, no, we didn't. But um, so in the subsequent cohort that we have, we will use hypertension in the, the multiple regression model uh, and try and look at it that way on the larger cohort. Uh, yeah, so that is something we, we do have in mind. Um, I think that's important to try and disentangle that. So yeah, thanks for that point. Super. Thank you very much for, for, for the question. So we'll move on and uh, James, I will uh, let you introduce the next speaker. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Mathilde Paré. 
who's going to talk to us today about cerebral blood flow and stiffness in end-stage renal disease, the acute effects of hemodialysis. Over to you. Sorry, everyone, about the little technical difficulties. And thank you, Dr. Fisher, for introducing me in this uh, seminar series. Oh, wow, now my computer really isn't collaborating. There you go. All right, so let's start and hope that this goes a little bit better than it started. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Mathilde Paré, and I'm a master's student, uh, an MDMSC student actually working with um, one of our hosts in this virtual seminar series, Patrice Brassard, as well as Dr. Mosena Garazi, um, who is a nephrologist in Quebec City, Canada. And we worked together, these two teams, um, on a pilot study back in the summer of 2018 um, in order to evaluate the um, acute effect of a hemodialysis session on cerebral blood flow on dynamic cerebral autoregulation, as well as uh, cerebral vascular stiffness during hemodialysis. So this is some of the results that I'll present to you. So hemodialysis, for those who are um, perhaps not familiar with it, is a renal replacement therapy that is targeted at end-stage renal disease patients. So these patients, for a variety of underlying pathologies, have a decreased renal function. Um, which involves both the reduction in filtration capacity of the kidneys as well as endocrine dysfunction. And all these problematic uh, result in renal failure, which progresses from a stage one to a stage five renal failure, uh, which is quantified by the um, remaining um, filtration capacity of the kidneys. So this progressive kidney failure uh, involves a lot of, causes a lot of problems, including um, accumulation of metabolic waste, um, accumulation of um, a lot of, of um, H plus ions and electro other electrolyte imbalance in these patients, as well as fluid accumulation. And the combination of all these factors results um, notably in vascular calcification as well as endothelial dysfunction, which are both associated with arterial stiffening in these patients. Um, so as I mentioned, end-stage renal disease patients require renal replacement therapy, which can be in the form of hemodialysis. However, there are, um, there's another way, which is peritoneal dialysis, which takes place uh, in a rather more physiological way, where patients um, are, are having their dialysis through their own peritoneal membrane within their abdomen. However, hemodialysis, which is our main interest, involves the extracorporeal filtration of blood, where a patient's blood will pass through um, a machine, so it will be pumped through the dialyzer that's represented on this um, picture, where the blood is going to run counter current to a uh, dialysate with predetermined electrolyte concentrations, um, and they will be separated by a semi permeable membrane across which, across which there will be the um, diffusion of the extra fluid that we want to remove, as well as equilibration of the electrolytes that we want to restore. So, hemodialysis, as I mentioned, uh, is um, not a very, I may not have mentioned it, but it's not a very physiological uh, treatment. In about 17% of patients, it induces acute hypotensive episodes. And in some fewer patients, it can also um, induce acute bouts of hypotensive episodes intradialytic. Um, there is also suggestive evidence that hemodialysis can be harmful to the brain. Um, however, the underlying mechanisms for that um, are relatively, uh, relatively unknown. Um, however, we can imagine that the generalized um, vascular dysfunction in these patients um, may play a role, especially arterial stiffness, and that if, for example, cerebral autoregulation were to be deficient in this population, um, these acute drops and increases in pressure during hemodialysis might uh, be harming the brain indeed. So indeed, the reason why we're so interested in cerebral blood flow during hemodialysis and in these end-stage renal disease patients is because uh, upon initiation of hemodialysis as a renal replacement therapy regimen, um, patients have an acceleration of cognitive decline that is more significant than in patients receiving peritoneal dialysis, the more physio physiological way of doing it. Um, just a little bit on arterial stiffness. Um, so we did have a great virtual seminar about it um, a little while back, but aortic stiffness is a non-traditional marker of cardiovascular mortality, and it has been associated with a wide range of physiological as well as clinical consequences, including cognitive decline. So on this figure, you can appreciate, um, so in the gray lines, you can see the pulse pressure wave that is being collected from a healthy patient, whereas the black line represents a um, 
a patient with aortic stiffening, and this results in an excessive pulsatility of blood flow within the arterial system. So this increase, um, this increased pressure, pulsatile um, pressure is going to be generated upon each heart cardiac contraction. The aorta is not going to be able to, it's not compliant enough to um, dissipate part of the pulsatile energy. So all that energy is going to move forward from the more central location to the micro vessels. Um, and it's going to harm the small vessels, especially the vascular beds with low resistance, as in the kidneys and the brain. Um, so we can assess uh, aortic stiffness non-invasively, and the assessment of arterial stiffness um, relies on the notion that as arteries become stiffer, the pressure wave that is going to be generated from the heart is going to travel faster from the more proximal to the more distal um, um, parts of the arterial system. So for example, we can measure the aortic stiffness as the time difference, as the uh, sorry, as the speed of the propagation of the wave that is propagating from the carotid to the femoral artery. So that is the carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. Um, that does require, however, knowledge of the path length that is being traveled by the pulse wave, which isn't always possible with um, intracranial vessels, obviously. So our objectives in this specific study were to evaluate the feasibility of measuring dynamic cerebral autoregulation during hemodialysis, to evaluate cerebral blood flow and cerebral blood flow pulsatility during hemodialysis, as well as cerebral vascular stiffness um, over a regional segment, which was defined as the segment between the heart and the middle cerebral artery, and as well how that stiffness was going to be progressing throughout hemodialysis. So in order to do so, we recruited patients from the nephrology clinic at l'Hôtel du Québec um, who were at least 18 years old and had been undergoing hemodialysis for at least three months. We excluded those with um, known cognitive impairments and diagnosis of dementia. And we also had to exclude some patients from analysis uh, when hemodialysis was inducing severe, um, not necessarily severe, I'm sorry, but very frequent arrhythmias, which were messing with our signals and would prevent um, transfer function analysis. Um, so our final sample of patients uh, is um, described in this table. So we ended up with nine patients, eight of which had an insinated middle cerebral artery. And these patients were rather representative of the general hemodialysis population. So this was our setup. Uh, you can appreciate that it's a very clinical um, pilot study that we did uh, and where we measured um, cerebral blood flow velocity, well, middle cerebral artery flow velocity with uh, transcranial Doppler ultrasound. We measured um, blood pressure continuously with photoplatismography, um, as well as blood pressure in a more intermittent fashion using the mobilograph uh, oscillometric device, um, which measured also central pulse pressure, uh, central blood pressure, and carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. And we also measured um, partial pressure of CO2, um, either arterial or capillary, uh, depending on the patient's vascular access. So we took these metrics, um, the, blue, the blue arrows on this diagram represent the moments where we were measuring, uh, continuously assessing cerebral blood flow velocity as well as MAP, uh, mean arterial blood pressure, um, during five minute bouts in order to, uh, in line with our objectives to measure dynamic autoregulation. And the white arrows are representing the intermittent metrics that we took, so PCO2, MAP, as well as carotid femoral pulse wave velocity. We also were interested in blood flow pulsatility, so we measured a pulsatility index, um, and as well as our marker of stiffness. Um, uh, so we measured, we wanted to measure the, um, the stiffness of the intracranial vessel somehow. So what we did is that we took the, measured the transit time between the heart and the middle cerebral artery by subtracting the time at which um, the peak of the R wave was occurring in this patient population, well in each patient, and the time where the foot of the um, TCD wave. So we can computed the diff time difference between these two points. Um, so in terms of statistics, we use generalized estimating equation models with simple comparisons to baseline in order to assess the progression of these different metrics uh, throughout dialysis, so for each patient. Um, so this is our hemodynamic uh, parameters and how these results um, were uh, ended up being. So there was an increase in heart rate that was significant after two hours of hemodialysis and which remained elevated um, through the rest of hemodialysis. We observed no significant changes in mean arterial blood pressure. However, um, yeah, so no changes in mean arterial blood pressure and no changes also in central pulse pressure. 
or carotid femoral pulse wave velocity, which was representative of uh, our aortic stiffness in that sense. In terms of cerebral blood flow velocity, we saw a decrease in maximum, so in peak uh, flow velocity in the middle cerebral artery at the first and second hour of hemodialysis. Um, well, they became significant at these time points. And minimal, middle, um, minimal uh, flow velocity uh, remained constant during hemodialysis, which resulted in a, um, a slightly decreased pulsatility index at the first and second hour of hemodialysis. And just to come back on the previous slide, um, we observed no significant changes in PCO2 throughout hemodialysis. Um, however, we saw an increase in cerebrovascular resistance after one hour of hemodialysis, and that remained elevated uh, throughout HD. Finally, um, our transit time that we computed between the heart and the middle cerebral artery was significantly elevated after one and two hours of hemodialysis, which suggested a decrease in stiffness, um, mostly of the intracranial vessel, given that our carotid femoral pulse wave velocity was stable and that the carotid femoral pulse wave velocity um, does include um, part of this, uh, the carotid artery as a segment. So in conclusion, um, I didn't mention our uh, transfer function analysis because we had some technical issues with that. However, uh, it may be feasible to evaluate dynamic cerebral autoregulation during hemodialysis. Um, in, a next, in a future study, we could use, for example, nonlinear analyses in order to do that um, with spontaneous oscillations that we can collect during HD. Um, and yeah, so future directions for this project would be to uh, gather up more information relative to the intracranial vascular dynamics, so uh, analyzing compliance, for example, and, resist and other metrics of resistance during HD. Um, and we also aim to characterize cerebral blood flow regulation in pre-hemodialysis chronic kidney disease patients, mostly looking at autoregulation and reactivity to CO2. Um, with that, I am done my presentation, and thank you to all of my teammates. So. All right. Okay, that's great. Thanks for a, a, a very nice presentation. Um, lot of very uh, challenging data, lots of measurements there, and lots of integrative physiology to get the, the teeth into. Just while we're looking for a few questions to come through um, the chat, mm -hmm. I guess, um, the challenge is maybe trying to ex explain all the all the different variables you're getting on the on the on the basis of some of the hemodynamics that you're observing. So um, apologies if I missed it, but what is there a reduction in, in, in blood volume with this measure? Presumably, the, I know it's coming back in, but there's a dead space there. And I just wonder how important that might be relative to maybe some of the other compensatory changes. I notice you have this increase in heart rate, which itself can affect these measurements of, of stiffness. So mm -hmm. Uh, you're quite right. It is um, quite a bit of a challenge to integrate all that physiological data, especially given that hemodialysis challenges the system in so many different ways. Um, but indeed, there is the removal of fluid during hemodialysis in most patients because they, they accumulated for a few days and then we got to get them rid of that excess fluid. So there may be a role of the decreased blood volume during hemodialysis. Um, there is also decreased cardiac output during uh, hemodialysis, so that might also be affecting um, their cerebral, um, their, auto, their regulation of their cerebral blood flow. Um, yeah, and there was also the increase in um, in heart rate. I think I think there may there is um, part of the challenge is that the removal of fluid might be actually activating the sympathetic activity in these patients. So they are known to have sympathetic sympathetic activation during hemodialysis. So that also might um, affect their uh, MCA resistance, and it's quite hard, difficult to integrate. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, could you just tell us a little bit more about your measure of arterial stiffness? I, I imagine most people would be familiar with the Sigma Core type device, where you're using the the tonometry pen at different locations. Mm -hmm. Not not the approach you're using here. Is that correct? No, no, definitely isn't. Um, the main reason being that intracranial vessels, obviously you cannot apply the tonometer to uh, an intracranial vessel, which is gonna, because the tonometer records pressure waves. Um, and that's why we wanted to take advantage of that property of, um, take advantage of the fact that just by having a pulse wave velocity, 
um, we can infer information about the stiffness. However, like I mentioned, we don't have a path length from, for example, for intracranial vessels. We can't measure with, well, with transcranial Doppler at the very least, we can't measure the length of the MCA. Um, so we decided to use the signals that were at hand, which were the AKG, the ECG signal and the transcranial Doppler. And by computing this time difference between the peak of the R wave, which um, essentially is um, the start of the cardiac contraction, and then the time before that wave that starts from the heart arrives to the MCA, that was sort of is how we wanted to infer the stiffness. I don't know if that's clear. That's great. Just a question um, in from Phil Ainsley here. Related to the last question, can you please comment on the level of anemia and or changes in hemoglobin or viscosity on CBF regulation? Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so all these patients were anemic, um, chronic kidney disease patients, and especially in the end stages, they're, they're all anemic, so they have um, baseline cerebral blood flow that is um, elevated at baseline before hemodialysis, just on any, any other day. Um, however, yeah, during the acute hemodialysis, they do have this hemoconcentration that happens. I do, I I've been thinking about this <laughs> in, in before the seminar, and there may be an effect on cerebral blood flow regulation. Um, for example, just the fact that there is a higher concentration of hemoglobin transiently, this could, um, I know this affects the uh, nitric oxide um, metabolism, I think, in the vessels, and this could alter uh, endothelial function, I believe. So it could affect our metrics as well. Okay, fabulous. Are there any more final questions? If not, we'll move on to the next speaker. Okay, nothing coming through. I will just thank you once again for a great talk, some fascinating data. Look forward to um, seeing how the, the project goes. Thank Brilliant. You. So the next speaker is Zoe Adams, who's joining us from the UK uh, quite late in the evening, and who's today going to talk to us about the role of cerebral vascular variants in the development of human hypertension. Over to you, Zoe. Thank you. Um, yep, so I work in the cardionomics research group at the University of Bristol uh, under the supervision of Emma Hart and Angus Nightingale and my PhD is funded by the British Heart Foundation. And today I'm going to um, talk about some data from our group looking at the role of cerebrovascular variants and then the development of hypertension. And this is work that was also funded by the British Heart Foundation. So the idea that um, cerebral blood flow could be linked to hypertension um, emerged in the 1950s um, when post-mortem studies showed that narrowed vertebral arteries uh, were more commonly found in individuals who had been hypertensive compared to those who'd had normal blood pressure. But at this point, it wasn't known uh, whether this vertebral narrowing was um, a result of the hypertension or whether it could in fact be um, a cause of the hypertension. But subsequent uh, animal studies have shown that you can actually see changes in the cerebral vasculature uh, prior to the development of hypertension. Um, for example, um, in young spontaneously hypertensive rats, you can see um, hypertrophy of some of the posterior um, cerebral vessels um, actually prior to these animals developing their hypertension. And uh, these ideas are summarized um, by the selfish brain hypothesis of hypertension, which states um, that um, an increase in cerebral vascular resistance uh, results in a reduction in cerebral blood flow. And this triggers an increase in the activity of the sympathetic nervous system, uh, causing an increased uh, in increase in blood pressure, which acts to maintain cerebral perfusion and prevent um, hypoperfusion of the brainstem. Now, in uh, humans, uh, a potential cause of this increased um, cerebral vascular res resistance is uh, cerebrovascular variants. So here we're talking about um, congenital um, anatomical variants, um, particularly in the posterior cerebral circulation. Uh, and these occur um, throughout the population. But it wasn't known uh, whether there was a causal link between these variants, um, the cerebral vascular resistance changes, and the development of hypertension. 
So uh, our group conducted a study looking at these variants in middle-aged hypertensive adults and normotensive controls. So we um, used magnetic resonance um, angiography techniques to uh, image the posterior cerebral circulation. And the two variants that we focused on in particular were vertebral artery hyperplasia, which you can see in the top right, and an incomplete circle of Willis, um, which occurs when you have either one or both um, posterior communicating arteries missing. And in the bottom right, you can see that this individual has both of those arteries missing. So we first established that uh, these variants are more common in uh, hypertensive adults versus normotensive controls. And this is true whether you look at um, vertebral artery hyperplasia uh, or incomplete circle of Willis on their own, or when these two uh, variants occur together in the same individual. We then looked at uh, the link between these variants and um, cerebral blood flow. So first, um, it's important to say that um, hypertensives had a uh, lower cerebral blood flow than normotensives. And this is true uh, whether um, these individuals had vertebral artery hyperplasia or whether they didn't. And this graph also shows um, that the, among hypertensives, the, if you have vertebral artery hyperplasia, then you tend to have a lower total cerebral blood flow than the hypertensives without. But this isn't the case in the, the normotensives. So you can see that there's no significant difference um, in the cerebral blood flow of normotensives with vertebral artery hyperplasia and those without. And this is important because it's, it's showing us that perhaps um, normotensives with vertebral artery hyperplasia are able to kind of compensate for this. Um, but then in some individuals, you know, the hypertensive group, perhaps they aren't able to. But this still doesn't tell us about the causal relationship between cerebral blood flow and the development of hypertension. So we then looked at um, cerebral vascular resistance and sympathetic nerve activity in our normotensive groups um, and then in um, subgroups of our hypertensives. And we looked at their sympathetic nerve activity because it's likely that uh, sympathetic activation is what underlies uh, the increase in blood pressure in hypertensives. And of particular interest were the borderline hypertensive groups. So this, these are individuals who um, have high normal blood pressure, but they're not yet hypertensive. So their daytime ambulatory systolic pressure is um, between 130 and 135 millimetres of mercury. And what's important is that you can see that they have a significantly greater cerebral vascular resistance than their age matched normotensive controls. But there is no significant difference in uh, sympathetic nerve activity between these two groups. So this is suggesting that um, you can see increases in cerebral vascular resistance prior to um, an increase in sympathetic nerve activity and an increase in blood pressure. And um, although this is a kind of cross-sectional way of looking at it, this lends um, support to the idea of the selfish brain hypothesis. So finally, we also just looked at these variants in um, young adults with hypertension. So um, young onset hypertension, we were talking about uh, hypertension developing in people who are younger than 40. And we didn't see a significant difference in the prevalence of these variants between hypertensives and normotensives when you consider them um, independently. But if you consider them together, we see that um, hypertensives are more likely to have either vertebral artery hyperplasia or an incomplete circle of Willis than their normotensive controls. Um, so this is suggesting that perhaps these variants are also important in the development of hypertension in young people. Um, who typically have fewer uh, risk factors for hypertension than um, middle-aged adults, for example. So just to conclude, um, we've shown that in our study, um, hypertension is associated with an increased prevalence of um, posterior cerebrovascular variants, as well as a reduced cerebral blood flow and an increased cerebral vascular resistance.
we've seen that uh, increased cerebral vascular resistance can occur prior to an increase in sympathetic nerve activity and the development of hypertension, which supports the idea that the selfish brain hypothesis of hypertension might underlie the development of hypertension in some individuals. And we've also seen that these cerebrovascular variants might be important in the development of hypertension in young people as well. So thank you for listening. Uh, these are the people that were involved in that study and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thanks Zoe. That's a, yeah, it's a, it's a great data set, very provocative and it's, it's great to see these new challenging ideas in, in this area. Um, just, um, I'll just ask a quick question while I wait for the, um, the chat to warm up and a few to, to come in. Um, in terms, I was interested in your, the sympathetic activity levels in your borderline um, hypertension group. So I know some, some groups have argued that there is elevated sympathetics in that population, haven't they? And, and that's um, been used as um, evidence that the elevated sympathetic activity drives the, the blood pressure long term, but it's clearly clearly a bit more variability there than, um, uh, than we might like. Do you, do you have any plans to do longitudinal studies? I know it's a lot easier said yeah. than... <laughs> I mean, yeah, well, that would be the, the best thing that we could do. Um, it would be great to be able to um, image uh, people when they're very young or, you know, potentially like young adults or maybe children before they've developed hypertension and then kind of track them through. Um, it's a bit tricky maybe, but there might be ways of doing it if, you know, in certain populations that are scanned for other reasons, perhaps. Um, but yeah, that would be the best way of, um, yeah, getting a more longitudinal way of looking at this. And, and in, just in terms of, so you're, you're saying that they're, they're underperfused. Is there, is there other evidence of hypoperfusion? I mean, what's the oxygenation, the tissue oxygenation like? Do you have any um, idea? Yeah, so we looked at um, perfusion of different um, different areas of the brain, as well as the kind of total um, cerebral blood flow. And all of the different areas that we looked at were, um, they had lower blood flow compared to in um, com like the people with variants versus those without. Mm. Yeah. Okay. A couple of questions coming in um, from Ronald Schondorf. Hyperplastic vertebral arteries are often encountered as a normal, inverted commas, finding. Do you have any data comparing the structural MRI measurements with flow velocities in the vertebral arteries? Could there be differences between those with compensatory flow in the larger artery with others that's lower? Yeah. Um, so we saw that, because um, we kind of, we looked at whether um, the contralateral vertebral could, com to, could compensate this. Um, so in the normotensives, we saw that, um, so we looked at basilar flow for that, and we saw that um, in the normotensive groups, um, there wasn't a difference in basilar flow between those um, with the variants and those without, but there was in the hypertensive group. So hypertensives with vertebral hyperplasia um, had a lower basilar flow compared to hypertensives without vertebral artery hyperplasia. So it, which is maybe indicating that, um, yeah, that, it, that hypertensives aren't able to compensate as well by the contralateral, with the contralateral artery. Um, I'm not really sure why, but uh, perhaps remodeling, that kind of thing, yeah. Question from Kathleen Miller. Great talk. Do you see any patterns in the demographics of the participants with the, uh, the vertebral artery hyperplasia or the missing circle of Willis, such as men, women, BMI, age, etc. Yeah, um, so, so in these, all of these stats, we, um, uh, BMI was accounted for because, so it was a covariate because it, it, the hypertensive did tend to have a higher BMI. Um, we didn't see any kind of trend for sex, um, but, you know, it, it would be interesting because the, you know, the, the middle age group that we were talking about, they would have included probably some premenopausal women, some peri, some older like, postmenopausal women. So it might be more important in the younger group, but we, yeah, we haven't seen a trend for sex yet. Okay, 
Just a quick follow-up from um, Ron Schondorf. Uh, the basilar artery is already at the level of the pons, may need some extracranial vessel, vessel measurements, so something to perhaps consider. Okay, so is there any more questions? Just hang on for a few minutes. Okay, if not, thanks Zoe. Thank you. That data, well done. All the best with the rest of your PhD. And we'll move on to our, our next speaker. So I'll introduce you real quick. Yep. Okay, so yeah, great pleasure to introduce um, Mickey Pham, um, who is currently uh, with me at the University of Auckland. Uh, who's going to talk about nitric oxide in transient ischemic attack patients. Over to you, Nicky. All right, thanks, James, for the introduction. And hello. Um, James and I share a laptop normally. He doesn't allow me to have my own. <laughs> and um, I better set the timer because if you he, see if I go over time, I won't get paid this month. Right, so, um, so yeah, my, my talk is about nitric oxide in transient ischemic attack patients. Um, so the talk I'm going to give is actually uh, one of a series of studies I did during my time in University of Wellington um, under the supervision of um, Associate Professor Shiktens. Um, so we did a series of studies in diet, on dietary nitrate supplementation and cerebral vascular function um, and blood pressure regulation in rats and in healthy control as well as in TIA patients or transient ischemic attack patients. So just a bit of background on transient ischemic attack. So these are patient groups that um, often uh, are at high risk of having a, a, a ischemic stroke down the line, especially in the first um, seven days following uh, symptom onset. Um, they're a tricky population to study because basically they have all the symptoms of a stroke but only lasting for about 30 minutes and there is no uh, residual symptoms so in brain scans. So basically the diagnosis relies heavily on the patient history. Um, and um, so previously we've shown that um, peak to peak blood pressure variability or fluctuation is elevated in transient ischemic attack patients as well as, um, and we know that reduced cerebral vascular function predicts um, future um, transient attacks as well as um, ischemic strokes as it's been mentioned previously in, in previous talks. Um, so switching gears a little bit and talking about nitric oxide. So it's quite important um, signaling molecule. It's discovery in biology. It's led to Nobel Prizes. It was named uh, Molecule of the Year, I think, in 96. So um, it's a uh, quite a valuable commodity. Um, the stock is always going up for nitric oxide. Get into it. Um, uh, so, and it's been shown that um, endogenous production of nitric oxide by endothelial nitric oxide synthase is reduced of aging. And um, with the two um, studies that we've done in, down in Wellington, um, we've shown that by increasing nitric oxide viability, you can improve or improve blood pressure variability as well as cerebral vascular function. And this is, in, again, in the rats um, stroke model as well as in healthy young populations. So what we want to know for this study is whether increasing nitric oxide viability with dietary nitrate supplementation could similarly improve blood pressure variability as well as um, cerebral vascular function. So the study design is that uh, we recruited uh, uh, 30 TIA patients acutely, um, so within 48 hours of symptom onset, and they would un undergo one week of either a placebo or sodium nitrate supplementation, so um, 10 milligrams per kg per day, which equates to about 300 grams of lettuce, that's a salad, basically. Um, at the same time, they undergo, these patients undergo standard treatment for the various medications that they take. Um, so just uh, very briefly, the study protocol, um, the patients undergo a five minute supine rest, followed by uh, a two, two minutes of hyperventilation and a two minute hypercapnic challenge to look at the cerebral vascular CO2 reactivity. Um, so some of the measurements, actually all the measurements have been mentioned in the previous talks. Uh, so we looked at uh, plasma nitrate and nitrate concentration, uh, expired gases, uh, cerebral blood velocity using transcranial Doppler, as well as um, blood pressure using a phenopress. Um, 
And I'll just go through some of the um, analysis that we did. Uh, so first one, just um, go, uh, blood pressure, B2B blood pressure variability. So in within a dynamic blood pressure signal, there are additional information that we can often we can get from the raw traces. And so these are fluctuations and low, fre low frequency fluctuations in blood pressure, um, a very low frequency. And there's low frequency fluctuations as well as high frequency changes. And if you perform a power spectral density analysis, you can get uh, changes in these signals in the different frequency bands. So on the left here, we have the middle cerebral artery velocity. And on the right, we have the mean blood pressure changes and very, very low, low and high frequency and uh, previous studies in uh, humans have shown that um, the low frequency um, changes are potentially um, modulated by sympathetic activity. Uh, and the myogenovascular functions involved in the very low and the low frequency. And the endothelial derived nitric oxide have been implicated in the high frequency ranges. Traditionally, um, we measure cerebral autoregulation. Again, that's been mentioned in a couple of previous talks. Uh, so basic, uh, brief overview, um, autoregulation is basically the ability of the brain blood flow to maintain constant in the face of changes in blood pressure. Um, so to analyze this, uh, we did a spontaneous blood pressure, um, uh, uh, transfer function analysis of the spontaneous blood pressure and cerebral blood velocity um, signals. Um, so if we look at the two signals, we can get a, cha a change in gain, which is the relationship between the blood pressure and cerebral blood flow velocity in the uh, vertical axis. Um, phase, which is the chain relationship between the two signals in the horizontal axis, as well as coherence, which is, reflects the linear linearity of the two signals. Um, in addition, um, um, cerebrovascular CO2 reactivity, that's been mentioned a few times already in the previous talks. And that's basically looking at uh, the blood vessel's response to um, changes in entitled well, arterial CO2. That's a quite potent vasodilator. And we've seen the relationship within a narrow change in entitled CO2. We've seen the relationship is linear, so you get a slope in the response. So, um, so jumping to the results, uh, what I should mention here that uh, um, we have on the y-axis, um, we have plasma nitrate and nitrate, as well as a baseline and a follow-up. Um, this is the placebo group, and this is the dietary nitrate supplementated group here. And so what we saw is that um, dietary nitrate was able to improve um, plasma nitrate to nitrate um, concentration. And here we have the cerebrovascular CO2 reactivity, so the MCAV to CO2 slope, um, baseline and follow up between the two groups. And previously in the healthy controls, we did observe a six specific effect where dietary nitrate improved or increased uh, this um, CO2 reactivity. But unfortunately in our patient group, we actually saw improvements irrespective of the treatment condition. Um, and we attribute this to a, a increased um, endothelial nitric oxide synthase. Um, so in TIA patients, about 80% of our patient group uh, receive statin, which is actually known to improve um, increased EDNOS expression activity. So we put this um, improvement in reactivity slope to that effect. And I should also mention that in the TIA population, uh, one week following um, the, the TI events, um, we saw a reduction in mean and systolic and diastolic blood pressure by about um, five to eight millimeters of mercury. Um, and there was no change in arterial stiffness. Um, okay, so now here we're looking at the, the power density so spectral analysis and the low frequency blood pressure, very low frequency blood pressure, as well as a very low frequency middle cerebral artery velocity. Um, so what we observe is that irrespective of treatment, we saw a reduction in the low frequency blood pressure variability. And we attribute that potentially to a reduced sympathetic modulation. And with dietary nitrate, we saw specifically a reduction in the very low frequency flow 
fluctuations in blood pressure as well as middle atrial velocity. So, and in the very low frequency, again, that's uh, attributed to myogenic vascular function changes. So, and nitric oxide has been implicated in the myogenic effects for that. Now, going moving on to the um, transfer function analysis to look at cerebral um, autoregulation and the very low frequency coherence, uh, low frequency gain, high frequency coherence, and high frequency gain. We saw an elevated um, low frequency gain at follow up, irrespective of the treatment. And we speculate that might be linked to the reduced sympathetic modulation following uh, one week following uh, TIA. We saw uh, dietary nitrate specifically, again, lower the, the very low frequency, the coherence, as well as, um, as, well as high frequency gain, uh, high frequency coherence. Um, so at the very low frequency, we attribute this to a low uh, improved myogenic vascular function. Um, uh, oh, and uh, that's potentially to um, in the, uh, in, improve nitric oxide viability and because and in the high frequency, uh, yeah, might be a direct effect of nitric oxide. So to summarize our finding, um, one week following TIA, uh, trend, uh, ischemic attack, um, we saw improvement in CO2 reactivity, which would attribute to a, a improved um, ENOS activity and expression associated with the statin treatment that the TIA patients under, underwent. We saw an increase in the blood, um, blood pressure MCAV gain, as well as a reduction in the blood pressure variability, irrespective of the treatment conditions. And it seems to be potentially a reduced um, sympathetic modulation. With our dietary nitrate supplementation, um, we saw uh, improved um, blood pressure variability, a reduced um, cerebral blood flow velocity variability, uh, which we attribute to a myogenic vascular function effect. And um, finally, um, a reduced coherence, which we attribute to directly to a nitric oxide viability per se. Um, yeah. But uh, what's left unknown, I guess, is whether these improvements, uh, these changes we observed with the nitrate supplementation improve clinical outcome and potentially reduce stroke risk. Um, that's areas for future study. Um, and I'd like to thank the following people. Uh, happy to take, take your questions. That's great. Thanks, Mickey. Um, I have the laptop this afternoon, by the way. Just so, um, um, a few, sorry, just questions coming in from Garen Anderson. Were medications between the groups matched? Yeah, so, so uh, that was for the majority of the, the antihypertensive, the statin um, intake. I was reasonably matched between the groups, but some of the smaller, um, uh, um, so some of the other medications were less so. But generally speaking, yes, the major medications. Um, could you um, just explain why you chose that dose and that duration? Right, right. Um, yeah, so uh, as mentioned before, in TIA patients, usually within the first week or seven days following TIA, uh, there's a, that's a window where there's a quite a significant increase in risk of recurrent TIA as well as, as, well as um, ischemic stroke. And so we thought that would be an ideal um, window for treatment, potentially to modify the risk factor. Um, with, with regards to dosage, it's uh, based on some of the previous studies that I've done during my PhD with Professor Benkeiser, where that dosage seemed to cause a, about a three to four fold increase in the plasma, circulating plasma nit nitrate and nitrate levels. Okay, that's good. Um, did you do anything in terms of assessing baseline diet? I just wonder, sometimes you see these supplements are a little bit more effective in people that are deficient in, to start with. Was, do you have any handle on that? Uh, right, yeah, so we didn't, in this study, we didn't choose to con uh, control for diet or monitor it. Uh, previously, we have done, and um, we instructed the, in, in the healthy control group, we instructed them to avoid nitrate-rich um, 
food, um, which then led to the critique that uh, we were comparing dietary nitrate supplementation with nitrate deprived um, diet. Um, the, the idea for this study was to ultimately reflect as best as we can in the real life situation where they undergo standard treatment and a normal diet that they otherwise would take. Um, yeah, so short answer is no, we didn't control for it, but the idea was to make it reflect more of a real life situation. Okay. That's helpful. Just a um, question here from Patrice in regards to the dynamic cerebral auto regulation. Uh, we can see low coherence in several patients. That's that's true. How confident are you with your interpretation of the the gain phase? Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So, um, so yeah, we could have improved the coherence by causing more dynamic changes in blood pressure, and ultimately it was decided. I mean, there was a crosstalk on um, JFIS about spontaneous versus forced um, uh, uh, auto regulation measurements. Um, Ultimately, for the TI patients, we want it to be as minimally invasive and as um, as possible for the for the patient group. Um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, sh sure, we could have we could have done a different protocol, but our rationale was that that, that would potentially potentially already a higher risk um, group of that we didn't want to agitate the system mm. further. Understandable. Yeah. Uh, question from uh, Sandra Billinger. Did you get information on the duration of TIA symptoms? I wonder if the shorter length of symptoms is less CBF uh, disruption and uh, could affect responsiveness of the supplement. Right, so with regard to the second part of the question, there was, because um, dietary nitrate has been a popular field of research in sports science and there is evidence for um, respondents and non-responders of the treatment. And our patients, we, have, we do see some people which had no very little in, in, increases in plasma nitrate and nitrate concentrations with the supplementation. So there are, within already there, there's a population uh, variability. Um, we didn't have, uh, we, we didn't have <coughs> a, a record of the duration of the TIA symptoms. Again, it's largely reliant on the neurologist that on their diagnosis, um, yeah. Just, you might have said this and I missed it, but where, were you doing it bilaterally? And yep. where was the TIA relative to the to the measures and did that matter? Um, right, uh, yeah, so those bilateral, um, bilateral uh, measurements. And previously we have shown that um, it does, the, side, the, hem, the side of the hemisphere is, does affect um, the cerebrovascular function, so um, changes. Um, yeah, so we didn't keep track of that either. Okay. Yeah, it's not, it's not incorporated now. So Sandra yeah. just mentioned, glad you consider the role of statins. And I, I agree with that, actually. Um, we did some work when I was in the um, US with Paul Fidel looking at statins in heart failure, showing reductions in sympathetic activity. Right. So right. that sort of ties in with one of your potential comments. Then, yeah. So. Fabulous. Any more questions while well, we have... Uh, Mickey on the hook. Okay, do we have any data on comorbidities in the TIA patients? Are there differences between them? Um, yeah, so generally speaking, we, uh, the patient groups, mm, no, we, we didn't keep track of that. Uh, yeah, uh, but, but uh, we, we took, we, uh, the main um, things we keep tra track of is the medication they were currently on, undergoing. But, um, the comorbidity, so that, that was um, part of the exclusion criteria that, um, that we try to aim to match, so uh, yeah. Okay, thanks Mickey. These are yeah, really challenging studies. I mean, any sort of longitudinal work is challenging, any patient work is challenging and doing this all together. So, so congratulations for, for that. Well done. Okay. Thank you very much to all the speakers. Again, an amazing seminar, great talks. Thank you to the audience for a, a great a great exchange. And I will end uh, the seminar by announcing uh, the next one. Um, so it will be dedicated to uh, dynamic cerebral autoregulation with uh, Dr. Jonathan Smurl from University of Calgary, who will chair the session.
and will it will it, it will focus about using driven blood pressure associations to quantify uh, cerebral autoregulation. So you should receive by email, Twitter, Facebook, or other media, uh, social media, the uh, further information for uh, for registration. So again, thank you very much, and see you in two weeks.